Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is Wednesday, February 24th. Let's get started. Okay, so one stock for you this, this morning that I would like to discuss with very interesting channel checks, and this is uh, another reopening stock. This is a theme in industrial, a value play, um, and the stock is called Lincoln Electric Holdings, symbol L-E-C-O, Lincoln Electric Holdings. Now, this is a welding company, so for automotive sector and industrial sector, this company provides the machines, the tools, and all kinds of services related to welding of metals and such and such. Uh, pretty well-established company. Anybody in the in this type of business would know exactly what Lincoln Electric does. Long time ago, we covered this in one of the Jaguar quarterly outlook, but that was at the time when we were bearish on the stock. Some of you may recall. And this time we are bullish on this stock with new channel checks that are coming out supporting that. Here's a very interesting picture that comes out uh, right over here. Uh, and if you look closely on this picture, you will see that there has been a sharp surge um, based on the welding organic uh, welding organic comp sales going from inflection point, which was negative minus 10% in the fourth quarter of 2020, and then in the first quarter of 2021, uh, flipping to positive territory, now looking at 0% growth. And this chart will likely continue. We'll get to about 10 to 15% growth rate in the next one to two quarters based on the channel checks that are coming out from Stifel this morning. Specifically, Stifel points out, I quote, we surveyed 95 North American welding and cutting distributors representing an estimated 15% of the industry revenues. Welding distributors report January, February sales up 1.3% year over year. First quarter 2021 sales expected to be up 2.2% year over year, while the inventories are up 3.3% and prices for welding machines and tools is up 280 basis points in the first quarter of 2021 year over year. Inventory stocking expectations have improved and price expectations increased since our last survey, which was done six weeks ago. 32% of the distributors expect demand to reach pre-COVID levels by the second quarter of this year. And 52, this is, um, and 52% of the prior survey conducted six weeks ago. So basically, cumulatively, of all of these 95 North American welding and cutting distributors are expecting better and better growth ahead for the next two to three quarters, reaching their peak demand level or pre-COVID level by the second quarter. Specifically pointing out, if you do the regression analysis for the three uh, companies that are out there that benefit from this trend, you will notice that Lincoln Electric Americas, which is the LECO, the stock right in front of us, this company is expected to predict a 5.9% growth rate, according to the regression model, by the second quarter of this year, versus a street estimate currently of 0%. Similarly, if you look at Illinois Tool Works or ITW, so this is Lico right here, and then if you go to ITW, this company is expected to see its growth rate reach 5.3% versus 0% street estimate, and Colfax, CFX, um, is expected to see better of the all three, 6.1% growth rate versus 0% street estimate. So these growth, uh, these trends are improving, for all of them. They're going from deep negative growth of 10% or so to flat to now single digit positive growth and, and, and ultimately rising all the way potentially by second or third quarter to double digit percentage. Now, to confirm these channel checks, I went ahead and looked at Colfax CFX earnings report but because this stock has been breaking out rather very, very strongly for the past two to three days on rather high volume. It turns out, in the earnings call, management said that they are setting their fiscal year 2021 revenue growth guidance between the range of 15 to 18 percent year over year versus street estimate of 10 percent. So take the midpoint is about 16 and a half percent versus 10 percent street estimate. They also expect very sharp recovery in free cash flow well above consensus estimates, mainly because during the pandemic time, they cut 
they're um, uh, they did a lot of cost cutting, and so they're running a very lean operation right now. So as a result, when the revenue growth goes sharply higher, they see the benefit of that falling sharply in the free cash flow line. Of all the three companies, though, I like Lico simply because of the technical picture, but I think all three of them could potentially benefit from here. Here is another technical look just to give you some idea. <clears throat> if you uh, if you look at from if you try to annotate this annotate this chart, you can see this stock was at 122, 124, pull back, formed a base, and now starting to emerge from this base. Earnings are already out of the way, so you don't need to worry about that. We're gonna start to get a, get a MACD bull cross pretty soon, and and also if you look at the um, the trend lines on the RSI, we are just starting to get early signs of a potential bull cross. RSI has climbed from a low of 35 to 50, and I think there's further room for improvement. So expect this to gradually trend higher and make a move all the way back to new 52-week high, basically $125 to $130 range in the next couple weeks to potentially a month to two months. So that's the play I like today, Lico. That's it from me. Let's go to Jay. Morning, everyone. Uh, so some IPO discussion this morning. Uh, two stocks. Uh, first one is Roblox. Uh, this is the video game platform. Uh, so it announced on Monday that it's What's going the ticker? to. Uh, mm -hmm. it, well, it's going to be RBLX. It, it's not uh, okay. trading yet. Um, Anyway, so on Monday, it announced that it's going to start trading via direct listing on March 10th. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is just in case we get questions on this from clients. Um, I did cover this stock uh, briefly in weekend research back on December 6th. Um, and this was because they were going to start listing or start trading back in December, but then uh, they decided to delay it and now we're set for March 10th. Um, so if you are interested in the company, you can refer to the December 6th weekend research and you'll get a, a brief overview of the company. Sounds good. And then the second IPO, uh, they just filed their S1 yesterday. Uh, it's a company called the Duckhorn Portfolio. The ticker is going to be NAPA, N-A-P-A. Um, this is a producer of luxury wines in North America. Um, according to their S1, uh, our portfolio is focused exclusively on the desirable luxury segment, the fastest growing segment of the wine market in the United, in the United States, according to IRI. Uh, they sell their wines in all 50 states and over 50 countries at retail prices ranging from $20 to $200 per bottle. And their portfolio of brands include uh, Duckhorn Vineyards, Decoy, uh, Costa Brown, Paradox, Migration, Canvas Back, and Postmark. Uh, when you look at the breakdown of sales by brand, uh, Duckhorn Vineyards and Decoy make up 73% of total revenue, while the other brands make up the other 27%. Um, they have a wholesale channel. They have a direct-to-consumer channel. Uh, the direct-to-consumer channel has a, a subscription wine club. Uh, it also has seven unique and high-touch tasting rooms that are located throughout Northern California and in the state of Washington. Uh, and then in terms of financial performance, uh, according to their S-1 filing, uh, fiscal year ended July 31st, 2020. Uh, they had $270 million, and that was up uh, year over year from $241 million. And then the most recent performance is uh, three months ended October 31st, uh, where they were at $91 million, which was up year over year uh, from $72 million. Um, so bottom line, I'm actually going to be uh, creating a homepage article for this one. You know, I thought it was interesting. Uh, right now, the only pure play wine company that you can trade publicly is a company called, hold on, let me find the ticker. Uh, it's WVVI, uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. Uh, so right now, that's the only pure play wine company that I know of. Um, so anyway, you know, uh, this one caught my attention and I am going to have a homepage article probably later today on it. 
Interesting. Looking forward to your article. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of these bottles in my cellar, by the way. Yeah, um, you love wine. Yeah, yeah. I have 120 <laughs> bottles in my cellar. Uh, I bet there's seven, eight of them are from Duckhorn. Um, okay. People send things over sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just randomly go online and buy stuff. So, uh, so yeah, um, I'll have one of these tonight and see, uh, you know, just uh, after while I'm reading your article on the homepage. <laughs> Um, I do want to, yeah, I do want to point out while you're on this, because yesterday in the webinar, when we were discussing the bull case for visa, right, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and previously we have been discussing bull case for travel sector coming back, United Airlines, American Airlines, and so many other airlines, lodging and all that stuff. The thought did cross my mind yesterday that there is a going to be, um, as if the travel comes back, Diageo could potentially be in play again. And it has been a strong stock rather for the last couple of months, but it has been consolidating for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where Johnny Walker, Black Label and all that stuff comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and we are gonna possibly see with the duty-free shop sales continue to you know accelerate from here and Diageo's majority of its sales comes from duty-free. And so this will likely be in play again. And then the same thing with Brown Foreman. Mm -hmm. Brown Foreman should be in play with a potential breakout scenario coming in front of us pretty soon. This stock has been consolidating for six months now. There's earnings reports that's coming out pretty soon on March 3rd. Now I bring all of this up because this is the kind of stuff that's still not in consensus view. In fact, I was looking at Brown Foreman's and, and Diageo's and all the spirits uh, sales that come from NABCA, mm -hmm. which is the um, North uh, National Alcoholic uh, Beverage Control Association that gets 25% of its industry's volume. So basically, it's pretty good channel checks for the country. And I'm going to read something here, a direct quote from Bank of America Research, which sort of tells you that nobody's really expecting fireworks in these in these spirit makers, wine makers. And in fact, in this case, I will put even Budweiser into this, which is BUD, as you all know. And nobody's really expecting any fireworks there. And that's where the element of surprise comes in to the upside. Bank of America said, I quote, Travel retail business will not recover this year. Many emerging markets remain subdued. Volatility and uncertainty to remain high for developed nations, unquote. This quote came out from Bank of America on February 3rd, and it applies to all of these names. Well, maybe you're wrong because travel is coming back, and maybe Diageo and Brown Foreman and on the winemaker that you discussed, but Anheuser Bush, all of them are going to be in play potentially in the next couple couple weeks to couple months. So, just wanted to point all that out. All right, great stuff. Let's go to Chronicle. Morning. Uh, I've liked the shipping sector lately, as you can tell from my uh, recent recommendations in uh, SBLK and STNG. Personally, I've already took profits in SBLK because it was getting close to my mentioned target of $15, but I'm still long and holding on to those leap calls in STNG. And in fact, I added to the position yesterday during the flush, but now um, I have another shipping company this morning. This one's a recent IPO. Uh, company is Zim Integrated Services, Z-I-M. I remember coming across this company when first working on the first read several weeks ago. And uh, what initially caught my attention was that this is a container shipping uh, company, which is a service that's currently in very high demand, especially in Asia Pacific, because of uh, faster than expected economic reopenings. But uh, globally speaking, uh, Zim is the 11th largest liner operator out there with an estimated $3.9 billion in revenue last year. Uh, according to filings, the trans the Transpacific represents about 40% of revenue, intra Asia at uh, 21%, and the fleet consists of 66 weekly lines, uh, calling at over 300 ports in uh, 80 countries. Now, going through uh, Clarkson Plateau's initiation note uh, from yesterday, uh, it looks like it looks to me like the bull case here is almost the exact same pitch. Uh, which I laid out for Starbolt carriers and also Scorpio tankers to an extent. Uh, basically, if I were to summarize this entire 29-page note, um, the company is not only currently realizing significantly higher shipping rates, but management is also expecting even higher rates for this year. Specifically, we're talking about a 16% increase to uh, $1 billion in 2020, 
followed by a 14% increase to $1.3 billion for this year. And the main reasons behind this bullish forecast are, once again, because of the historically low um, order book as percentage of fleet and a low supply of ships relative to the reacceleration in demand, uh, because a lot, a lot of the smaller players are, are still struggling to secure financing. So one thing you'll notice with uh, my other recent calls in shipping is that I'm only going after the biggest players. Uh, for example, Starbuck owns the largest dry bulk fleet in the world. Uh, meanwhile, Scorpio owns the largest fleet of oil tankers, and this company, Zim, is one of the largest container shipping operators globally. So I'm not going after um, the smaller potatoes who are still struggling to secure loans and are going to have to repair their balance sheets instead of building up and modernizing their fleets. Uh, speaking about balance sheets and liquidity, uh, Zim is also in a position for much stronger uh, profitability going forward, with net income expected to surge from negative $3.2 million in 2019 uh, to 541 million dollars in 2020, followed by 467 this year, and that's going to help them reduce their debt to EBITDA ratio from 8.0 in 2018, um, all the way down to 0.6 by the end of this year. So I feel like I'm almost regurgitating my pitch for SBLK and STNG here, but I like this stock and I might look to initiate a position um, in this one after having taken profits in. SBLK. Um, in terms of price targets, Clarkson's Plateau is looking for $30 based on $1 billion of estimated EBITDA uh, for this year. So about 50% upside from current levels. Very interesting. This is a um, rather new IPO. I think it came to the market in late January and it had a hot trend, hot run since then. And, and naturally in the last couple of days with the market selling off, it has pulled back. Chronicle, you, you this is the third pitch on on uh, from you about tanker stocks in Jaguar media in the past what month or so month and a half so you really love this space uh, tanker stocks all of them basically now yes. um, uh, I was in SPLK a lot of jet clients were in SPLK so when you first presented that and so many many uh, clients emails and text messages and all that so everybody made an absolute killing in this one this stock has been pretty hot and then we got into STNG, the Scorpio tanker, which was the second bull case. And we're still in this position currently. And now ZIM, which I had never heard of until this one. I have to say, though, when I see uh, when it comes to shippers and having followed this industry for such a long time, this is remarkable. I think the most compelling bull case that you have here are these two bottom charts here. Um, you, a billion dollars in EBITDA with leverage ratio crashing. So balance sheet has been repaired tremendously over the course of three years with practically, you know, no worries about the debt. I mean, this company can do so much with this kind of firepower when they're raising, when they're producing free cash flow of this magnitude with, you know, with leverage ratios down to the levels. They could do so many things with it. They could do share buybacks. They could do large dividends announcements. They could do, they could buy more ships. They could buy other companies. They could expand the moat by doing tuck in acquisitions. So, and that's the kind of, not only the balance sheet, but the also the income statement recovery um, given the rising shipper rates. I think these are very, very compelling cases for all of these tankers. In fact, I made a comment in the chat room last week as well that there's a bull market in tankers. People just don't know it yet. And clearly you have been ahead of everybody with all of these uh, discussions in this space. So kudos to you. All right, any quick last minute thoughts on this one? Nope, I uh, love all the right. sector. Okay, perfect. $30 a price target, which is 50% upside from here. All right, folks, we're going to stop over here. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the chat room shortly.